Okay, uh, our last next speaker is uh, Stella Ford uh, with a presentation of Feeding, feeding Economy. All right, thank you very much, and thank you everyone for bearing with me for the technical. All right, and a bit of a side note here in the beginning, I just wanted to point out that um, we've actually updated the title from this from, say, uh, Feeding a Colony to Feeding a Settlement. It's just in line with a lot of the conversations we've been having or conversations I've been having with people about uh, the nature of language that we're using in relation to what we're trying to do here, going to space. Um, all right. So uh, the focus of this talk is about ISRU in a space settlement, but a big portion of this is going to be dedicated towards defining the time point when you should be looking to move into consistent ISRU. And here we're going to talk about a more comprehensive system designed to feed the entirety of one or satisfy the entirety of one individual's nutritional needs, but that time point comes a lot later than many people expect. Uh, so throughout the years of talking to different people in these development groups, I've often found that there is a perception that a lot of the early colonies will go there with the intent to set up ISRU by the time of their arrival or shortly thereafter. And I think that that is a notion that we need to, as a community, step away from because the numbers do not agree with it in any sense. Okay. And so to take a bit of a peek at what we do for nutrition on the ISS right now, it is almost entirely prepackaged foods. Um, during the mission resupplies, there are small contingents of fresh food that is usually uh, personally specific to the astronauts or that has been requested. But the vast majority of your food is going to be vacuum sealed or pressure canned in a way similar to an autoclave. This is a gold standard for long-term food preparation because the food comes without the risk of pathogens. Uh, many of the food products uh, brought to the ISS are also irradiated to prevent any sort of bacterial contamination uh, in them. And this is a very important step. It's something that has allowed us to send food up there for a, a very far time ahead and be sure that it will be of a suitable quality and not interfere with the mission more broadly once it is consumed. Okay. Any better? So, yeah, okay. We'll move this a little higher. Is that better? Yeah. Ah, all right. Okay. And so, um, the prepackaged diet here, and these numbers will make a little bit more sense with the next slide as well, but the prepackaged diet um, consists of about 14.5% packaging. So the rest of it is the food that you're going to be consuming, and for the purposes of this talk, that's going to include any waste food that is not consumed but has left the package. Um, and the numbers associated with that are what we're going to be looking at for the overall diet as well. But so using a number of 8,000 pounds per kilogram, and this is for something leaving low Earth orbit, we're looking at a price of roughly uh, $7.26 million per for an individual's food needs for a year, and over a million dollars of that is packaging loss. So there is a very significant incentive to pursue ISRU because it will help us reduce that waste and take that mass that we are sending up and convert it into something that we can use again and again to grow further food and satisfy further need. Um, so to get into where those numbers came from a little bit, NASA defines uh, an individual's dietary needs as 908 kilograms per person per year, and this is based off of the 776 kilograms of food plus 132 kilograms of packaging that I mentioned earlier. Um, the $8,000 per kilogram uh, comes from quotes directly from Elon, where he claims that regardless of what anyone else is stating, that you can have a starship in LEO that can bring 150 tons to the moon after eight refuelings or some comparable amount of mass to Mars. This is just a metric to get us to $8,000 per kilogram that we can use to further analyze these different scenarios. Um, and so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is held independent of the ECLIS systems. A lot of conversation around food production gets into the oxygen consumption uh, associated with it, what, you're, what that's going to do to the humidity within your habitat. We're not talking about that today. We're purely interested in the production of food. Okay, and so for that, um, if we're not using the prepackaged diet and the majority of the rest of the converse of this talk is not going to focus on a prepackaged diet, um, we are going to focus on four primary foods. And these represent a lot of the model foods used uh, for ISRU. If you're looking to uh, build a diet, here is a good framework for you to start from. And so 
For this diet, we're talking 30% fish, 35% sweet potatoes, 21% tomatoes, and this is meant to be a category that encompasses leafy greens. It's not as nutritionally specific, it's, or it's not as calorically specific, it's more broad spectrum nutrition, and wheat. And as I said before, these are all just models to be able to run these numbers and kind of get a sense of what we're looking at in terms of ISR review. And so this is assuming that you'll be on a terrestrial body, either the moon or Mars. And in that case, you would be uh, extracting your water from the local resources, which makes a lot more sense when you look at the time frame necessary to get the payback from ISRU. And you would likely be extracting your nitrogen in this case as well. Yes, you're going to come into the system with a certain amount of nitrogen, but you cannot anticipate that this is going to be a closed system recovering everything. Even within water itself, you're going to have to add water inputs to this. And this has been confirmed again and again by NASA and on the ISS. Okay. And so just a note on the supplemental nutrients. Um, so nitrogen has been confirmed in sufficient quantities on Mars to satisfy everything we need. All the micronutrients um, have been shown in the Viking studies. And L-Cross actually provides very compelling evidence that the moon is a suitable place for harvesting uh, the chemical inputs we would need to run a functional ISRU system. Um, and this is just a bit of a deeper look at the diet itself, showing that even with this model diet, we can actually get some value out of it. This is macronutrient balance to be an acceptable diet. Sounds a bit brutal day to day, but because uh, that is three meals a day, uh, 365 days a year, you would be eating tilapia, tomatoes, sourdough, and um, a little bit of veggie oil to up your fat content. You actually do have to make veggie oil independently or bring it. That's not something I address in this talk, but it is another number that you're going to need to look into. Okay. And so now that we've covered a lot of the framework for everything, I want to start digging into the specifics for the different uh, foodstuffs that we're talking about. And so the first is tilapia. So anyone who's looked into aquaculture before will know that your fish are essentially the, uh, the power behind your system. They're the generator that is fueling the uh, agricultural activity that you're going to see downstream. And it is, uh, as such, it's a very... Um, it's a part of the system that you have to be precise about and make sure that you are meeting the sufficient needs. So just talking the basic physical structure of this, we're looking, you can build a very light system that will satisfy your uh, fish culture needs. So in commercial fish farming right now, it's very popular to use stainless steel frames with an HDPE liner, similar to a pond liner. This is about uh, 0.2 kilograms per cube or per square meter in terms of the uh, mass per surface area that you need to line the tank or the pond. And this is used all across earth for commercial fish farming right now. Now. And if it can stand up to the wear and tear of a gravel surface on Earth with our current gravity, then Mars or the Moon would be perfectly fine with this sort of system. Um, and so in order to satisfy the demands of a single individual, and the majority of what we're going to talk about today is for the dietary needs of a single individual, we're looking at over 200 kilograms of fish per year. As I said, this is 30% of your diet uh, taken from the 776 uh, kilograms of food that you need to intake every year. So we can look at the growth rate of tilapia and looking at the individualized growth rate of the uh, agricultural products that we're talking about is sort of the key to this whole talk. And so when you look at tilapia, they grow about two and a half grams per day under ideal conditions, and it will require some fine tuning to do that. But you can actually stage them in three separate tanks. You can have a higher density for your young tilapia. You grow them out in a more spacious tank as they get a bit closer to harvest. And this allows you to manage your populations, but also reduce your overall tank volume. So the circular tank that is pictured here would actually be big enough to uh, grow all of the food for a single astronaut for a single year. This is 810 liters, and this uh, accounts for about 200 individual tilapia that you'd be consuming. I was interested in that number. Um, and this would be divided into three cohorts. You know, your fingerling portion of this tank is roughly one sixth and the adult tilapia would be then one third. But then looking at that uh, volumetric number and the amount of tilapia that you're raising per day, you can actually calculate that back against the amount of packaging that you would be spending if you were to send up vacuum sealed tilapia. So in this case, that's something like 92 grams per day, given the amount of tilapia that you would need to be eating as an individual uh, throughout the year. So then looking at this number, you can then work backwards from the mass required to build this system to say that it would take 213 days of living, uh, of consuming all of your tilapia from this tank versus packaging before you reach parity. 
So anyone who's familiar with aquaculture will note that I've really only mentioned the tank itself. Um, so behind this, uh, in, in this map does include the pumps, the, uh, uh, the biofiltration tank that we would need as well for this, and a header tank of a similar size as well. Um, but the one thing that I have not included in this tilapia calculation that will change this number is feeding the tilapia themselves. So they are, in fact, an organism. They do require food, and they are the only one from this agricultural system. Everything else will be eating uh, essentially the waste from this tilapia. Um, and so to give a bit more detail on the tanks themselves, this is a better view of the HDPE liner uh, and the uh, stainless steel frames, you can get a good um, view of what that is. This is actually suitable for the crops themselves as well. You are able to do a 10 centimeter wall here and fill that bed with an expanded media coming from either lunar or Martian regolith. And then you don't have to import that material either because the whole point with ISRU is bring as little as possible. You're paying for that stuff that you're bringing and you're offsetting other mass that could be useful to your main mission by bringing it. And so here we get back to the fish feed a bit and you can see those shorter 10 centimeter tanks, but the ones on the right in this image here are actually duckweed. Duckweed is a, um, it's a popular um, um, aquatic plant that is used in aquaculture a lot to try and uh, close the cycle a bit so that way a small scale farmer can grow food for their fish at home. Um, so it, re it reproduces incredibly quickly. You can actually harvest about 20% of the volume of um, duckweed that you see here per day. And you can su um, substitute a significant portion of uh, tilapia's diet with this. And this has been shown in many studies. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you see another input to the fish's diet, as well as one of the primary sources, uh, primary sinks for the um, the uh, biomass waste that comes from agriculture. Here we're talking about the sweet potato greens or the stalks from wheat. Um, and so those are black soldier fly larvae. They're again, very popular with home permaculturists. And so then looking at that, um, we come up with a diet for the fish food, which is shifted a little, of about 50% duckweed, 25% ground fish meal and oil, and 25% black soldier fly larvae. And so I want to touch on that middle item there a little bit as well, because it has been repeatedly shown that um, most fish in aquaculture cannot survive without the addition of fish meal and fish oil into their diet. Um, this is a thing on Earth. It's in all of the sinking and floating fish feed pellets that you'll find as well. But that's just a consideration that we need to take into account. If you're trying to do an ISRU system, make sure you scale it up to include the fish that are necessary to go back into the system to be processed. All right, and now we're moving over into sweet potatoes. And so these are very popular uh, subsistence crop across the globe because they have very high micronutrient values and they'll help to round out an otherwise sparse diet. Um, we're using that same approach on Mars. They're more, uh, more nutrient dense than white potatoes and they're as easy to grow. Um, and actually, I want to pause here for a moment, too, to state that um, for the sweet potatoes and the soil crops and in the calculations for the duckweed, um, I'm using a sample bed, which would be a one meter bed per, um, that is essentially continuous along the characteristic length uh, of the necessary volume for the crop. So to break that down a little bit, for sweet potatoes, we need 12.25 square meters of growing area in order to calculate the required mass for this. I've essentially said it's a one meter bed that runs 12.2 meters long. It's a one meter wide bed that runs 12.2 meters long. It's bounded by stainless steel on all sides and it has uh, the same HDPE liner underneath as well. And so, Sweet potatoes, you can get about three crops per year in a controlled environment. So using that turnover and the productivity of sweet potatoes, we get that 12.25 uh, meters squared number. And we end up with about 110 grams of packaging material saved for every day that you're consuming sweet potatoes from your garden versus flying them up to the ISS. And again, this comes out to a great number. This is less than a year, 269 days to reach parity. If you're truly trying to settle a new planet, this is a number that should not be a problem for anyone. But for a lot of people who say you want to do a 30 day, you know, visit to Mars and you're spending two years uh, getting there and back in that sort or six months each side getting there and back, it definitely uh, throws a bit of shade on that sort of thing as well, because the space numbers that I am indicating um, will also uh, give you a bit of an insight as to what this would look like inside something like a starship. 
So we have a thousand cubic meters within a starship. But I know most of the starship designs that I've seen, they do tend to uh, claim all of that space very quickly. And there, there isn't a hundred meters to put aside for, uh, for gardening. So that's definitely something to consider if you're looking at a long duration space flight mission, or you're looking to potentially set up on an asteroid or something where you cannot rely on the uh, terrestrial accommodations. Okay. Um, and I just want to jump back to the fish as well. So we had a, a data of just over 200 days for that. Um, the added mass of the tray for the duckweed and a second one for the black soldier fly larva do push that closer to 300 days. Okay. And our third item is wheat. Uh, so this has been very heavily studied by a lot of space development groups, and these uh, pictures actually come from Utah State University, who has been um, instrumental in developing cultivars of dwarf wheat. And so a uh, bit of a side note here, dwarf wheat is especially popular in a lot of dwarf uh, crop varieties because they allow you to do multi-layer uh, growth. So for these, I know I've been I've worked with a group before that we modeled uh, growth trays at about uh, 18 inches spacing because it allows you to get something small like wheat in. I think more of like half a meter or so is a more realistic uh, number that you could use if you're trying to maximize the space. But even on some, even on Mars, even on the moon, you can definitely get a bit more 3D with your agriculture if that is one of your limiting factors. If not, spread out as much as you need, but your space requirements remain the same. Okay, and so for wheat, we need about 40 uh, meters squared. Um, notably, you could sur supply your entire diet with wheat, depending on how much space you want to use. It's a very calorically dense crop and is a staple crop across the globe for that reason, but it's also about balancing your macronutrients. So one of the earlier slides I showed, uh, showed you guys showed that we were within the macronutrient target ranges. But if we go much higher on the wheat, we will quickly exceed that. Um, but wheat is also a fairly uh, low density crop. So per square meter, you're getting um, less than a kilogram per harvest, or you're getting, yeah, less than a kilogram of actual seeds that you can process. So that's one thing where it benefits from terrestrial agriculture as well, because you're able to spread out much more easily. Um, that being said, that's why we only have 43 grams per day in terms of packaging saved, because you just need so much more material to get to the surface area that you need to grow this wheat. And then your parity becomes 1,800 days. So this is something to really note here. If you're growing wheat, you, are, you need to be invested in this for a very long time. It's going to take a very large amount of space to create a sustainable crop of wheat. It's and then um, one of our last item, or our last item for the day here, is tomatoes. Um, and so these actually tend to produce a very large volume per square meter to the point where you could definitely grow tomatoes uh, beyond your nutritional needs and have the space for it. So the modeling I did was off of 350 gram six inch uh, planters, and these are very common. Um, and so with those, you can use dwarf uh, determinant tomato cultivars that uh, produce a couple kilograms per harvest. And this is at just over a two month time frame. So these actually have one of the uh, best, uh, well, not the best, but one of the best uh, parity time frames too, partly because you are using so little mass per tomato plant as well and getting such a harvest out of them. All right. And so um, salad greens as well uh, don't require quite as much mass and tend to have a very fast turnover. But one of the big things with tomatoes and salad greens is that a lot of these are focused on the, uh, the vitamins, the micronutrients that you're getting out of these. They're not big contributors to your carbohydrate need, your proteins, your fiber, any of that. And not big on fats either. But 33 days to parity definitely inspires uh, me, at least, to keep including tomatoes and other salad greens within the colony designs that I'm pursuing or talking about with other people. And one other thing to remember with all of this agriculture that we're talking about is that it goes very far beyond just satisfying your nutritional needs. So I've included the days to parity for ISRU, partly because a lot of colonists don't really care how long it's going to take. They're very interested in making it happen. You know, a lot of people are looking to go to Mars one way. And in that sense, it's not a question of whether or not we should do this. It's a matter of what it will cost. And having these numbers on hand when you go to someone with a mission design or you're even looking to game it out yourself can be very helpful for understanding what the early nature of your colony is going to be like. And on that note, 
I definitely want to encourage people to uh, look into different ways of incorporating their gardening needs or their agricultural needs throughout the colony. So I know some of the people in here have worked with me on colony designs in the past too, and it's something we've always taken a bit of into consideration is to make sure that anything that could be maintained by an individual would be set up in such a way that it would be easy to do so here with ad hoc watering. And to undermine some of what I've just said for the last 20 minutes, there are a ton of hidden costs that I did not talk about or did not factor into this, and we're going to list a few of them before we end here. Um, a lot of those are in the harvesting and planting of the crops themselves. So unless you've got advanced robotics to go around, identify which ones are ripe, do it um, all yourself, or you're going to have to do this all yourself. That comes with additional mass. Um, on the right here, you'll see Boston Dynamics' Spot Mini with a somewhat terrifying robot exoskeleton on the top half that is capable of using computer vision to identify ripe crops and harvest them, but it's definitely something that you'd have to commit to and it's a specialist system. Um, planting itself is another hidden cost too, because on the left we have a tractor from Harper's University in the UK and their hands-free hectare project where they pursued a, a lot of this as well. Um, I think that they're a very great group to look into because the amount of equipment necessary to do that was not as high as a lot of uh, you know commercial agriculture farms, but far beyond what would be um, acceptable within most missions to the moon or Mars. Um, additional drawbacks is ISRU comes with loss that you're not going to see in prepackaged foods. Um, so we have root rot in the sweet potatoes on the top right here. We have tomato blight in the bottom left here. And while these are things that we would try and avoid, fungal spores are absolutely tiny. You're never going to prevent all of them from entering a ship and who knows when they could crop up in your crops. And if you are not prepared for that with some sort of prepared long-term storage, whether you've been drying your grains, preserving them in some sort of way, you're, you need to have a backup plan for that. And that's something that is not factored into the mass budget, either in this study or in others that I've seen about this. Um, a big thing too is the time it takes to do this agriculture. I already mentioned um, the robotics as an alternative investment, but uh, for reference, 10% of the U.S. population or of the U.S. professional population is employed in agriculture. So that's 10% of the population of the U.S. is committed to making sure that we can all eat every single day. If you don't have similar numbers in your Mars colony design, I would love to hear why. Um, and... Okay, um, we're going to skip this one because we're a little short on time. There are a lot of societal um, factors that have been studied and identified as things that we need to incorporate into our food, uh, into our diets, into our approach to food in general. Uh, this is from a paper by Wolkovist and Lee. I suggest everyone check it out. And the last thing are the broader implications, and then we'll move over to questions, which are a lot of what I've been saying throughout all of this. Um, be prepared for a two-year uh, payback period on your ISRU. Keep a diversity in your crops, dedicate people to these systems, and treat it like your life depends on it, because it absolutely does. All right, and any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Being British, I'm very much looking forward to an exclusive diet of fish and chips. <laughs> well, my question is regarding you know, be, uh, synonymous with that mm -hmm. um, is, have it become an assumption or is it still being challenged? Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's not an assumption, but I have done the math on many, uh, and many other fish species and why would you choose anything other than tilapia unless you really like the taste of something else? They grow at least twice as fast as everything else I've seen. Wow. Hey, Sally. Uh, do you have hmm. specific objectives for, uh, for the health standards for 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 the, uh, you know, for the settlers based on food? Yes. Um, and so, uh, Bill and I have worked on projects before, and um, I definitely do. This talk was not really meant to get into the specifics of nutritional balance or anything. It's just meant to more to establish a framework when you're looking to talk about ISRU, because so frequently I've seen people propose things that just don't match the numbers. Has there been much research into um, like an optimal hybrid between ISRU and food package two? <laughs> Yes, come back next year. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks for your talk. Uh, I was wondering whether, um, or how much margin, if any, the numbers have, and also then how much margin would be needed to sort of maintain. Mm -hmm. um, 
any settlement robust to things like crop failures? Yes. Um, so uh, the tilapia and duckweed are the only two that have the margin built in. It's a 20% margin on both of those at the moment. Um, the other, you know, ground crops do not at the moment. Um, I would say as much as you're comfortable with, I would say that's more of a question of safety factor. You know, I would start from there and then back into how much you would actually need. This is just meant to be a bare bones assumption. What, what about the question of um, human waste in, in the system? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yeah. so human waste is a biohazard. You have to thermally sterilize it before it can be incorporated back into the system. Um, aquaponics is not necessarily set up to incorporate human waste in that sort of system. Personally, I would look into um, uh, the fatita compost worms would be my approach to that, and then use a filter organism like chickens to cycle those through and then incorporate them. Chickens present their own issue if you want to start incorporating them in diets, are you? Thank you for the first talk. I assume that your yield figures are using uh, growth on Earth. And would that be slower, longer? Years? It definitely could be, but I tried to source all of my numbers from controlled growing conditions in greenhouse or specifically space-based universities. I know for the wheat and the sweet potatoes, they both came out of uh, space-based studies of the um, dwarf tomato yields are were not just because they're so overabundant to begin with. Um, this is definitely a topic I'm very interested in. I couldn't really find great data on it over the past couple months or so, but I'm, if you please email me if you've got the data. Yeah, uh, so I asked you, would it be 100% after a period of time, or would you always have to have some triple of resources coming in from Earth? So this is essentially intended to be the start of a framework for a two-year plan to get to ISRU full-time. I anticipate that you would still be harvesting um, something like 5% of your total water volume per month um, or so. That's not a hard number. That's just a general estimate. Um, you'd also be looking at nitrogen inputs as well and a lot of uh, micronutrients, NPK. You'd be looking at putting an NPK into the system based on a lot of different factors. Again, this does uh, depend a lot on the temperature and the conditions in that specific greenhouse. But yeah, you would probably have to harvest those, presumably from the local rocks, process them into a bioavailable format, and then likely deliver them either. Well, there are a couple actually delivery points. You could deliver it to the black soldier fly larva. You can do uh, direct into the water, or you could do some sort of nutrient amendment for the fish in their pellets. Are you sure there are an awful lot of leaves on those tomato plants edible or does that go into the waste? I was assuming they go into the waste. This is definitely a topic that is a little outside of my wheelhouse is the, because uh, I know sweet potato greens are commonly considered edible as well, but I've just, I've never had them. I'm not really sure how to prepare them. I'm sorry, thank you. Great presentation. Please comment on a Yes, uh, Isola is a wonderful alternative to duckweed. Um, it's a nitrogen fixer as well. And so to mention that duckweed is also a nitrogen fixing plant, um, which is very nice in uh, Mars where you might have excess nitrogen just due to uh, abiotic processes as well. Um, but yeah, Isola is another uh, substitute. I think they have slightly different growing conditions is the main differentiation between the two and their physical structure is a little different. I think Isola is a little bushier. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone.